Howdy partner! Welcome to the COM300 module on genre. Our objectives for this module are to examine different genres, to identify historical organizing principles of the genres, and apply that principle to a new artifact. It's a kind of a basic move in genre criticism. Second, to distinguish between generic description, generic participation, and generic application as different modes of genre analysis. And third, to compare the role of different types of reasoning in the development and evolution of genres. The working vocabulary is, as always, your responsibility here. So what's a genre? Well, you, you already basically know somehow, deep down, what a genre is. What type of music do you like? What type of movies do you go to, right? So, so you know that a genre is a group or a type or a class of artifacts. Um, you've already studied them in this class. Deliberative rhetoric, epideictic rhetoric, and forensic rhetoric are all rooted in particular situations. Forensic, you know, the guilt or innocence of someone, um, and the genre of the, the courtroom speech, right? So, um, you know, and, and of course, there's, there's lots of different examples, and we'll talk about some more as we go on. Campbell and Jameson's definition of a genre is a constellation or fusion or clustering of situations, style, and substance. So, I think this is kind of a nice metaphor. A constellation is kind of like an arrangement, right? A, a particular, unique, interesting arrangement of the situation, what is the rhetoric responding to? What's the situation that creates the genre, right? And then the style of the genre and the substance of the points being made um, in, the, in the rhetoric. All right, so all of that creates an organizing principle, an overarching principle that kind of defines here's what the genre is. So slasher movies, you know, there's, there's quite a list. There's going to be a chase. There's going to be young teens. People are going to die badly in a multiple, um, you know, varied different sorts of ways. Um, often there's kind of a superhuman killer who keeps coming back and manages to run faster than everyone even though they're just shambling along, right? So, um, so we could define with those characteristics um, a little bit more specificity for what is a slasher movie. What stylistic elements, what substantive elements do we see in that slasher genre? And there's lots of different ones. Um, eulogies, when people die. Apologies, when someone's um, committed an error um, or some uh, offense in society. Inaugural addresses, um, State of the Union addresses, uh, transition speeches between the power of one person and the power of another, um, uh, music videos, uh, lots of different things. Culture jamming, as we'll see in a minute. All right. So what is particularly important about the context or the history for genre analysis? Well, the only way we know about a genre is because it's been experienced over time. And the point made early on in genre studies was that certain situations recur over and over and over again, like people die or um, there's a scandal and someone is implicated, right? So these situations recur over and over and over again so that there are similar rhetorical responses over time. What kinds of things do we say? How do we say them when people are, are, have died, right? Um, the rhetorical situation is repeated over and over and over again, and that sparks rhetoric that has some similarities, that generically kind of resembles um, other examples. And if it does a pretty good job, then usually it's accepted. And if it doesn't do a very good job, then it's usually rejected as an example of the genre. So our knowledge of a genre comes from our experience of the history of that genre. How many romantic comedies have you seen to give you an understanding of what one should look like now in your expectation? All right. So how do inductive and deductive reasoning play out in genre analysis? When you are developing a genre, you're creating an organizing principle, you're looking at examples, 
and you're trying to find what's similar about all these eulogies or these apologies. What do they all have in common? And that is inductive reasoning. You're moving from a series of specific examples, specific speeches or artifacts, and you're developing a larger organizing principle. That's inductive. It's argument from example. And so the same checks still apply. Are there a sufficient number of examples? Are they fairly typical? Are, they, um, are there any negative examples? Right? So um, we can still question that um, as we go through this process. Well, when you take an organizing principle, a genre, and then apply it to a specific example to see like if it's a if it's a part of that genre well then that's deductive you're taking a larger general genre and you're applying it to a specific example and that's deductive inductive use examples to develop a larger principle deductive take the larger principle and apply it to a specific example So the difference between description, participation, and application is basically what I was just saying. Description is where you develop and describe an organizing principle. Foss talks about a variety of, of genres that have been investigated. Narratives of breast cancer survivors as a genre. The email ballot that we all used to receive, you know, weigh in, yes or no, do you agree, right? Um, corporate histories um, that are often in uh, corporate reports. Um, humorous incivility, using the examples of Beavis and Butthead, uh, Howard Stern Show, and Seinfeld, right? So, um, so there's a lot of different possible genres to describe out there um, as part of rhetorical analysis. Participation is when we apply an organizing principle and see, is this an example of the genre? So, um, Foss talks about, you know, there's a UFO museum in Roswell, New Mexico. Is this an example of conspiracy theory? Right? So, um, is this conspiracy rhetoric? Well, in that case, you're looking to see if this museum example is um, a member of the conspiracy rhetoric genre. Right? And finally is application. This is, to me, more interesting than participation. You spend a whole paper saying, is this movie a cowboy movie? It's, it's not very interesting. But application is where you start applying the organizing principle and analyzing problems and differences and how the genre you know, evolves and changes, right? So zombie movies were zombie movies until you know, along came movies like Shaun of the Dead. And all of a sudden, we've got this wacky combination of comedy and, and zombie horror. Right? So um, a sort of a new application of an organizing principle. Um, Foss mentions the example of body or performance art that really violates the genre of visual art. Um, it's, it's quite different to see people performing with their body in different ways. And the example of Once Upon a Time in the West, which violated the Western genre, but was well-liked and well-received. How do you know if you've identified characteristics that are interesting and helpful for the genre? Foss says there's kind of four things to look at. Can the rules, the boundaries of the genre, be described so that other critics could follow them? If you say, these are the characteristics of country music, can I give that to someone else and let them listen to music and they can say, okay, that, that one is and, and that one isn't, right? Can they follow the rules? Are there similarities in substance and style that are related to the situation? Right? The whole thing often focuses on the situation. And so the situation lends itself to certain kinds of stylistic and substantive types of, of rhetoric. So in that instance, are they related to the situation? Do you know you've got something because they are part and parcel of the response to the situation? Would the absence of the characteristic change the nature of the artifact? Right? If it if it didn't have this quality of the genre, would it would it really change the nature of the genre of the artifact? And the most important thing is, does a generic uh, characteristic contribute to insight? The acid test. Does it help us understand rhetoric? Right? And that's the big test. 
Can genres flow together? Absolutely. You've seen your, you know, different types of music splinter into different, you know, so um, we got, um, you know, rock and roll, and then we got uh, heavy metal rock, and then we have, you know, pop rock, and we have, you know, all these different kinds. Um, the same thing is true of country music. We have, you know, pop country, and then we have uh, country rap uh, now, and, um, and a variety of others. Um, and so, you know, ultimately then, there are what we call rhetorical hybrids. A rhetorical hybrid is when an example, an artifact, is a member of more than one genre. All right, so I like to read um, stories about a gumshoe wizard, right? Both a wizard and a detective. And so you get kind of both elements there, you know, solving things, crimes, supernatural crimes, um, and using magic and invoking spells and so forth. So. Um, you get the idea that it sometimes can be very attractive and new to have a rhetorical hybrid. Um, but sometimes the new ones or some of the rhetorical hybrids are really, really bad. Um, and that's because they violate our expectations for the genre. So um, uh, I'll ask you later to give an example of a failed rhetorical hybrid. So an example of a rhetorical hybrid, when Lyndon Baines Johnson gave the eulogy for John F. Kennedy, who was assassinated, um, you know, he, he um, used epideictic rhetoric, he praised um, Kennedy and so forth, but he was also concerned a little bit about the direction of the country and where we were going, and so he slipped in some policy rhetoric as well. And so it was kind of a blend, really, of epideictic rhetoric, um, praising the president who had been assassinated, but also deliberative rhetoric, setting a course for the nation moving forward. Another example of that in, in uh, modern parlance is the movie Cowboys and Aliens. So um, you can kind of see they took two different genres and mixed them together, and some people didn't work very well, and for others they really enjoyed it. So Gilmore's analysis of the genre of handover speeches, which speeches did he analyze, and what are the four elements he identifies for the organizing principle, and he says something about the importance of number four, do you agree? Why or why not? And I'll leave that for you to bring to the table. Let's talk about Harzman's generic analysis of Banksy at Disneyland. So <clears throat> the research question is, what attributes constitute a communication artifact as a culture jam? And to what extent does Banksy at Disneyland participate within that genre of culture jamming? Well, culture jamming is representation of voices at the periphery. It's distortion of an artifact to voice a critique. Oftentimes it's against an institution, it's against an icon, um, you know, Apple or Android, or um, sometimes it can be against, uh, you know, Disneyland or Disney World. Um, it can be against a number of things, right? So um, it relies a little bit on the renown, the, fa the fame of the icon that it's culture jamming. So, in terms of the elements of genre, first, the, the genre of culture jamming is contingent on the situational requirement that there be some kind of image or sound or icon representing a larger corporation, event, institution, or person, right? So there has to be this kind of larger icon. That's the situation it's responding to. Second, the substantive and stylistic approach to culture jamming is to distort the icon in some way. Now there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of color and there's, you know, subtitles and titles and, and lots of different symbols and stuff that get used. But the common theme about the style and substance of this culture jamming is that it distorts the message in a way that changes the meaning or um, the apparent uh, meaning of the, of the symbol. So the organizational principle then is the combination of um, the famous icon, the use of distortion, and the increase of awareness, the double take, where we broaden associations and we start to interrogate things that otherwise just go unquestioned. So then uh, Harzman talks about Banksy at Disneyland, which was a display where Banksy went and put, um, I, I think that uh, um, he had uh, a dummy in an orange jumpsuit 
with, with sensory deprivation gear, kneeling um, and representing prisoners at Guantanamo. And, uh, um, and so what he did was he first, he targeted a representative artifact, which was at Disneyland, the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. And they had a sign saying, photo opportunity. And so he put it right in the photo opportunity. Second, um, the dummy was put there and placed there, um, and uh, as people began to take pictures, they began to see, um, and that sort of third created awareness that that was a, a distortion of the photo op, right, um, because the dummy's in the background, and third, it created awareness of the victims of the federal government. It showcased the interplay of here you're having your pleasure, and these people are still being punished without rights, right? Um, and so uh, the conclusion is about violating the hyper-reality of, of uh, Disney um, and kind of quotes Baudrillard um, and uh, um, the great spectacle of modern media, right? So um, the audience is reminded of what it costs others for their privilege, right? And so that's the culture jamming critique. Interesting and helpful. So post this. Identify some epic failures in creating a rhetorical hybrid, either in movies or in song. How did it try to blend genres? And why do you think it failed? I'm riding off into the sunset, folks. Hope you all have a great day.